The imagery in our text from Mark today is rather graphic. And listening to it in 2018, in the comfort of Oak Park, it seems a bit dramatic and overly harsh. It's difficult for us to hear, and it seems very legalistic and judgmental. Not at all the way we like to picture Jesus. Although, if we're honest, it may resonate with some of our deepest fears about God. It's important for us to remember that these words weren't originally written for us, sitting here in Oak Park in 2018, although it doesn't mean that we can't learn from them, or that we shouldn't try to understand how to apply it to our lives today as followers of Christ as Christians. Those early Christians in Mark's community would have recognized that Jesus was speaking metaphorically, referencing sayings that were part of familiar proverbs in Jesus' day, not literally suggesting that they cut off offending body parts. The stark imagery is used to impress upon the audience the grave seriousness of abandoning their faith of choosing to follow the way of the world instead of the way of Jesus, of conforming to societal norms and definitions of greatness versus accepting the first shall be last, and we are called to welcome, not fear, our neighbor. These are tough things to do in the best of times, when we're feeling physically comfortable, emotionally secure, and surrounded by mostly like-minded people, with little fear of our neighbors turning on us for our religious or political beliefs. But it's even tougher if you and your friends are actually suffering hardship and persecution, if you're struggling to make ends meet, or doing okay, but not as well as others so you feel a little less than. One could argue that the language in the text about the consequences of abandoning one's faith in pursuit of a better and more just future society needed to be graphic and attention-getting in order to compete with the allure of immediate gratification and status in today's world. This text challenged Mark's audience and us, to examine the quality of our discipleship, our identity as Christians. Where does our identity as Christians fit in among the many ways in which we name or identify ourselves by our ethnicity, our gender, our occupation, our hometown, our political party? Is our faith something personal and private, or something that we strive to live out loud in our daily actions, even at the risk of saying something that will make others uncomfortable? Perhaps causing them to think of us less favorably, maybe even unfriend us? Or even worse, cause us social, economic, or physical harm? Let's face it, choosing to live out our faith can be tough, especially when we're not 100% sure what exactly we're called to do. It's pretty easy to spot things that seem wrong, unjust, unfair, unethical, but it's much harder to know how to fix that that seems wrong. Specifically, what am I supposed to do? What can I do? Will it even work? Will it be enough to make a difference? Now this internal struggle isn't new or unique, and in fact it's one of the primary themes in the book of Esther, which was likely written many, 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 many years ago between the 4th and 3rd century BCE. So this is a bit of an internal question and struggle. Now as Maureen noted, uh, as well as, as Harriet, there are many unusual things about the book of Esther. And I encourage you to read it in its entirety when you have a moment. It really won't take that long. Uh, the excerpts that we did today really don't do the book 
justice, but the writing style is very readable and the story is extremely engaging. Esther has been described as a Jewish novella containing all the elements of a popular romance novel. The young and beautiful heroine, the wicked and scheming villain, the wise older father figure, and an inept and laughable ruler. By the end of the story, good triumphs over evil, leading to that big celebration that Harriet mentioned, has been known as Purim, which is still celebrated today. But before you mistake this for a lighthearted summer read, you should know that the Book of Esther also explores darker themes. Racial hatred, the threat of genocide, and the evil of unchecked pride and narcissism. It is a work of fiction written to entertain, inspire, and comfort the Jews who at that time were living in exile marginalized and powerless members of Persian society. It was written to reassure them that the status quo is not everlasting. Change happens, and dramatic, unthinkable reversals of fortune can occur. It was also written to remind them that God is always on the side of the oppressed, working through ordinary people who are willing to boldly step up and speak truth to power, often at the risk of great personal danger. It's these darker themes that lead to the central struggle for Esther. And frankly, what made this text seem so appropriate to me this week, as I struggled to personally process the inconceivable events in New York and Washington, D.C. that blanketed the news. These days, I personally need reassurance that the status quo is not everlasting. And to believe that good can and will eventually conquer evil. When I'm able to gain a sense of perspective and curb my temptation to descend into spirals of anger and hand-wringing anxiousness and despair, I can see hope. I found that sometimes it's healthy to give myself a media timeout, just a little break. I find that timeouts that we use with our kids work. A media timeout gives me a chance to catch my breath, let my fight or flight reflexes simmer down a bit, and reactivate the part of my brain that thinks versus reacts. So what gives me hope? That there are people, ordinary people, just like you and me, who are willing to continue to speak up and resist for the benefits of others, even when they personally have nothing to gain. And in fact, they are willing to put themselves, their reputations, their families at great risk to try to do what they think is right. Some do it publicly and loudly to call attention to the situations, decisions, and systems that are wrong because they penalize the poor and sustain oppression. These are the marchers, the protesters, the social media activists who get the word out. And they're important because unless people of good faith are aware of a wrong, they can't even begin to try to make it right. And sometimes an indignant crowd can drive change, especially if it's really large, well publicized, and persistent. But equally important are those who perhaps don't see themselves as activists or leaders. They're just people living their lives. In some cases, rather comfortable lives. Until they see something so wrong that they feel compelled to do whatever they can to try to make it right. We certainly saw examples of that this week in Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, in Deborah Ramirez, Judge Kavanaugh's second accuser, whose friends describe her as strong, but a very private person, who is not innately brave, she is being brave. 
and in Anna Maria Archilla and Maria Gallagher, the two survivors of sexual assault who on Friday stubbornly refused to let the elevator door close on Senator Jeff Flake until he looked them in the eyes, acknowledged the silent pain and feelings of powerlessness that they share with many, many women in America, and listened to their challenge to act responsibly, to try to do the right thing. Like Esther in our text, none of these women sought the position that they were in. And none of them had any guarantee that speaking up would make a bit of difference. They didn't know if they would be believed. They certainly didn't know if they, what they had to say would change anything. And they were reasonably afraid that there would be repercussions for breaking their silence. Yet they did it anyway. Because they felt it was the right thing to do, and they were in the position to do it. They did it afraid. I first heard the phrase, do it afraid, at the UCC Regional Youth Event that I and several pilgrims um, attended at Elmhurst College this summer. It's also apparently the title of a book, a song, a blog, it's been quoted many places. It came up in the conference, though, within the context of our theme, which was a just world for all, your voice matters. That theme was a rallying cry to the youth of our denomination to let them know that the world needs for them to speak up, to speak their truth, to ignite change. It was also meant to provide reassurance that we, as adults and as their faith community, will support them and listen. Because we know it's hard to speak up when you don't feel you're in a position of power. Now in the small group discussions, the youth admitted that they often don't speak up because they're unsure what to say and they're afraid of the possible negative consequences, feeling uncomfortable at the moment, or maybe even creating longer lasting impressions that would later prove to limit their future potential. So we talked about the need to do it afraid. To believe that as long as we're sincerely trying to do what is fair, just, and compassionate for our neighbor, we can be confident that we are on the right path. And that someday the change that we're fighting for, the wrong that we're trying to right, will be achieved. Perhaps not as soon as we'd like, but sooner than if we remain silent. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tells his disciples not to let anything prevent them from helping and advocating for the least among us, not even fear. As Christians, we are called to speak up, to speak truth to power when the opportunity arises even if we didn't ask for that opportunity, and we're not sure it will make any difference. As the saying goes, just do it. The world needs you to, and we, your faith community, are here to support you. Amen.